Park Center, Mayor of Plymouth, I truly want to appreciate everyone here tonight. Uh, we're here to talk about the U.S. 30 Coalition and what we've been doing the last three or four years. Um, this sort of started uh, when um, Mayor Ryan Daniel from Columbia City realized that they were getting uh, Michigan terms or J terms in their city. And he didn't like that at all. Um, they have uh, some real issues with traffic there, as, as do as do, as do War Warsaw and, to a point, uh, Marshall County and Plymouth. And uh, so um, the U.S. 30 Coalition got together, Ryan and myself and Mayor Tomer from, uh, from Warsaw and uh, some Mayor from, uh, from Fort Wayne and Valparaiso and this is how it got started. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to Mike Dell, um, County Commissioner, and he's going to take it from here. For thank you, Mayor. I want to thank you for coming too, and I'm, I'm just tickled with the turnout. Uh, again, as the Mayor said, we've got to start planning, um, and I'll just take you back to, I remember as a little boy, 30 and 31, when it went right through the heart of Plymouth. I mean, I can remember those days with traffic all backed up. So. The other 30 went in, and, and certainly there could be some heartburn over it if you're a farmer. I get it. But again, I think we're at that point where we need to think about making an upgrade again. And uh, I've been going to the meetings. Um, I'm in favor of it. But certainly we as a community need to have some input on it. And that's what these meetings are for. They'll be going on here for a year, year and a half, whatever it takes to try to help determine where interchanges will be, what, you know, just how this will plan and go through here so we can give our thoughts to end out as they begin that planning process. So um, I want to ex ex uh, express to you there aren't any county funds basically going into this at all. It will all be state or federal funds. Um, I know roads are a hot topic. I get it. Um, they're a hot topic for me here in the county too. So just want to put your mind at ease that you aren't going to see funds siphoned off of our county roads that we need to improve going into this project. So. Um, Set that aside and don't don't let that enter into this if you would. So, I'm going to turn this over to Dennis Falkenberg with uh, Appian. Uh, they're the consultant that uh, helped on the 31 project be a liaison between the communities and NDOT. And uh, so he'll uh, make the presentation here now. He's been very involved or knows what's going on with it. And so I appreciate uh, appreciate you being up here, Dennis. Dennis Falkenberg. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Again, my name is Dennis Falkenberg, and I have Lori Modlin, also from Appian, here <clears throat> with Appian Transportation uh, Government Affairs Firm in Indianapolis. Uh, we do transportation consulting, work on projects all over Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, my former life, I spent a couple decades at NDOT. I was a Deputy Commissioner Chief Financial Officer at the Department of Transportation. So I kind of learned how this stuff works. I've seen highway projects from the ground up. I've seen them that go well, and I've seen them that don't go well. And the first thing that I tell folks like the US 30 Coalition is you need to involve people early. That's why you're here tonight. Nothing has been decided. And before anybody puts a line on paper, find out what the local folks want and need, local elected officials and the general public. And so that's why we're here tonight is to begin the very beginning planning process for what might happen to the US 30. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of background that I told you a little bit about Appian. Who is this coalition? The coalition US 30, as Commissioner Gelb said <coughs> and Mayor Sender said, a uh, group uh, all the way from uh, over in Valparaiso in uh, uh, Porter County. Uh, to Allen County on the east end of the state, US 30, all the way across the state, every county has been involved in getting together to see what ought to happen to 30. <clears throat> First of all, they, they engaged Lori and I to see what the local folks along the way thought about this project and what do we think of the idea of a freeway. Overwhelmingly, people in every county said, something needs to be done to 30. It needs to become a freeway, but how do you do that? And doing that so that it serves every community along the way, not just passing through the community, but giving good access to every community. It's a really, really important thing of the project. Yes, you have a question. How come it needs to become a freeway? 
Uh, I'm getting to that. Okay. A lot of information here about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The uh, every county along the way has representatives on the board of directors of this US 30 coalition. So every county, uh, cities in the counties and so forth have input into what this coalition is doing and, and working with that. And the question was asked, why does it need to become a freeway? My prediction with my 30 years in this business is it's going to become a freeway and you ought to get involved in how it becomes a freeway as that is surely going to happen. Why is that going to happen? It's because of what's happening out on that road with the traffic that's there, the accident history and so forth, the truck volumes and, and so forth that I'll go into in a minute. Groups around the state that have been looking at transportation, future transportation, like uh, the Connexus Logistics Council, a statewide group of, of people that move freight all over Indiana, all over the country, named this project as one of the most important projects in the state of Indiana was US 30 becoming a freeway. When Governor, uh, Vice President Pence, now uh, at, at the time, Governor Pence was governor of Indiana, he named a blue ribbon panel of transportation of what should happen next, the big next things in transportation in Indiana. I was honored to be appointed by him to be one of the members of that blue ribbon panel to serve on that. And it was made up mostly of business people around the state, people who move freight, uh, economic development and business people and so forth. That, that said, US 30 is one of the top projects in the state that needs to happen. Something needs to happen to US 30 because of the traffic that that road moves, the safety problems that it has, and so forth. So you had the Connexus Logistics Council, you had the Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel on Trans Transportation, both naming these as high, high priorities of something to happen. And then um, considerable interest from legislative leaders, uh, Senator David Long of Fort Wayne became a big priority of his, and the Roads Chairman over in Valparaiso and so forth. So lots of interest in 30. So I predict with all that interest, every group uh, looking at this at projects all over Indiana. This one immediately goes to the top. And then when I look at the data, the traffic on this road and its safety problems, I say, this is going to happen. So you better really get involved in it and work on it so it works well for you. That's my prediction. Um, the, uh, the, way, the way we're looking at this for a quarter plan of like how you how the US 30 freeway would develop. My advice to the folks along the way is every county should do a plan and look at what you want to do. So in Allen County, they're working on what would a freeway in Allen County look like over in Kosciuszko County and Whitley County and so forth along the way. We've spent several evenings in Stark County over uh, west of you uh, working on a county plan for them. And they're looking at its groups just like you. Start with the elected officials, what they think, and then broaden it out into groups that include a lot of agricultural groups uh, for uh, how that road could be configured so it serves you. So um, that that's where this is beginning tonight, I think, so that you can form into that kind of a group that would, would develop a plan for Marshall County. And then it fits into a corridor plan. And how that works is what you want to do in your county plan needs to fit with the corner wide plan. Um, if it's going to be a freeway, then no, you can't have a driveway. You can't have a stoplight. You can't have an at grade rail, rail crossing, that kind of thing. Uh, a freeway is a freeway with only entrance and exits at uh, interchange. Uh, at grade rail crossing. So a railroad would have to have an overpass, is what I mean by an at grade rail crossing. Uh, I think one of our handouts, we included an inventory sheet. We've inventoried US 30 from uh, Illinois to Ohio, and looking at every county along the way, and all of the things that need to be dealt with for this to become a freeway. And I, I guess I should back up and say, what is a freeway? Some people say a limited access highway, and they're not the same. 
uh, kind of in layman's terms, they sound the same, but US 30 and 31 around here are limited access, but they're not freeways. Uh, limited access means you can't just put a driveway uh, in it without getting a permit from the state of Indiana. So limited access, they own the access to it, you have to get a permit to put a driveway there. A freeway means you don't have driveways, you don't have intersections at county roads, uh, you don't have stoplights, uh, they're all interchanges. Uh, either they're closed off or they become an interchange or an overpass. You can have an overpass if it's important to get from one side of the highway to the other, but there may not be enough traffic moving to dictate you get on and off. It may just be an overpass. So that's kind of the decision that, that we're looking at for every uh, one of those points along the way is if there's a stoplight, does that need to be an interchange? Should that become an interchange? And then you have ramps, and totally different configurations of ramps that, that might be used, depending on the geography of any area and so forth. Or do you close that and you say, no, you can't get on and off there anymore, you gotta go a mile down the road. Those are the things you look at. And you look at the local road access. Is there a way to get a mile down the road? Or do you have to build a new access road and take farmland to do that? You try to avoid that, use as little uh, farmland as possible. And, and work those things out where access is needed. And uh, that's quite the right for the local people for the people traveling through. No, no. It's, it's to give you good access, and that's what we want to try to figure out so no lives are sacrificed, so that we give you good access so you can pull on and off safely. So, all of those things are things that will be dealt with along the way. Um, the data that I was talking about, why this needs to become a freeway. Um, travel, I travel all the roads in Indiana and for years and years and years. I've crossed, I live in Indianapolis, um, I've crossed 30 many, many times, but I never had much occasion to go east and west on 30, more than just a few miles. But now that I've worked on this project the last year, I have been <coughs> absolutely astounded with the traffic this road carries. I don't think people around the state have a clue what you deal with on the east-west traffic on US 30. And the car volumes, the truck volumes, uh, especially the truck volumes that this road carries. And when you mix that many cars and that many trucks together, it's a huge, huge safety issue, which is what you've seen in some of the accident statistics that when we look at US 30 across the US state. Uh, some really bad results. Um, the high truck volumes, there is traffic of about 30,000 vehicles a day on parts of US 30 across Indiana. That is higher than many of the interstate highways around Indiana. Uh, it's, it's astounding if you look at them all and then look what this uh, Highway 30 carries. It's bigger than many of the interstates. Um, by 2035, and that sounds like a long way away, but in highway planning terms, a 20-year look is normal. You look at what's going to happen in the next 20 years. And by 2035, NDOT's traffic modeling is showing that 31% of the vehicles on US 30 uh, will be trucks. And James Turnwald with MACOG will be here in a little bit to talk with you about some of the traffic that's happening in Marshall County, and I bet you can do one even better than that uh, on something you deal with here. Um, How can you say fewer fatalities when you're going to have higher speeds? Pardon me? How can you say fewer fatalities when you're going to have higher speeds? Generally, when you have safe entrance and exit rather than stop signs or stop light, pulling into that traffic, it's much safer. You have higher traffic but less accidents. The uh, in-dot traffic modeling also, and I'll show you one of the handouts also, was a project page developed by NDOT that has all these statistics that I'm talking about are on this project sheet that Department of Transportation put together. They're showing that uh, <coughs> if you were to convert this uh, Highway 30 to a freeway, that in that next 20 years, it will grow to 81,000 vehicles a day. They are projecting this is an economic dynamo that if this were freeway control, 81,000 vehicles a day, 
will be traveling this road. They're saying, if you don't do anything, you just leave it the same as it is now. The 30,000 vehicles a day now will grow to 38,000. So if you think it's bad now, there'll be 38,000 instead of 30 on it. So again, that's why I predict something will be done to fix this road with or without your help. So you really ought to roll up your sleeves and be a part of the process to help to get this done. Um, the, as I said on that uh, inventory sheet, 344 potential impact sheet uh, uh, points along US 30 from state line to state line. So that's a lot of driveways, a lot of county roads, a lot of stop lights, railroad crossings, and so forth that have to be dealt with. Um, the crash severity of being an issue, that's the trucks and the cars being mixed together. Huge numbers of trucks and that many cars, and they're traveling at high speeds. Um, and the speeds that they're going is, is really critical that, uh, especially where you have lights in Warsaw, you have some high-speed trucks and they don't stop at the light and the horrible river crashes have been occurring. Um, NDOT's traffic modeling is projecting, and these are all NDOT statistics that are on that sheet that we handed out, uh, predicting that converting this road to a freeway would lead to 323 fewer accidents a year. That's an incredible decrease in, in accidents, and you know, four of those being fatalities. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is huge, four fatalities a year, this is say. Um, and then a ton of dollars that, you know, compared to the safety is inconsequential, but you know, we're projecting $716 million a year in accident savings um, that that this economic dynamo that they think this highway could be with, with the freight that moves on there now, the trucks that move on that highway, as bad as it is, that, that with a freeway, even more will come this way, uh, creating over 10,000 new jobs and increasing gross regional project product, excuse me, gross regional product by almost a billion dollars. So, this economic dynamo, they think 30 is, that if you convert this to a freeway and you give communities like yours good access, and I know that's why you're all here, is will I be able to get, an on, get on and off the highway? And that's what we'll all figure out, is where do those access and exit points need to be so it works well for you. It can create this kind of an economy for you. Um, Again, yeah, I talked about the unsafe word perception, uh, doing it correctly, um, so forth. Uh, so again, now that uh, decisions are being made right now, you know that last year in the Indiana legislature, they approved a huge funding package for highways. Um, roads in Indiana are not in good condition, so the first of that money is to all be spent on fixing what's in place now rather than building new stuff. So the first five years of that plan, you're getting about a billion dollars a year. First five years of that plan, and that's fixing the current road situation they need. But then after that, they're going to be build, building the new stuff that's, that's in the queue. And something like US 30, with it being tops on the list of the governor's Florida panel, the Connexus list, and the importance with, with all the safety issues that it has in high traffic volumes, those projects are going to be coming in in the next five to ten years. So that's why you need to be planning now for what do we do when they come to us. The worst thing you can do in, in my 30 years in, in doing this is somebody from the state show up with a roll of plans, roll them out on the table and say, here's what we're going to do. Because it's hard to change after that. Right now, there is no role of plans. Your commissioners, your mayor, the US 30 coalition are trying to find out what every community needs so we can go influence what they will put on that role of plans when they show up here in the next five, 10 years, whatever it is, uh, to start building this road. Uh, some of the things that aren't involved here is, you know, NDOT says you stay away from county, you know, from road cuts and you don't do land acquisition and so forth, but we know that's going to be an issue. Uh, so we look at where an interchange goes, uh, where will that farmer have to go to get across the highway? 
do they need an overpass, that kind of thing. So we don't make decisions on that, but we look at what we recommend and say the community consensus seems to be to, to uh, take those things into consideration. Who do you ask for these community consensus? Pardon me? Who do you ask for community consensus? Groups like you. That's what we're doing here tonight, is beginning that process with you. The question was, who do you go ask to get this community consensus? And I said, people like you. And she says, the guy driving the combine that may need to get out on the road or across the road, I have a different opinion than the business person. And that's why we've had extensive involvement from agricultural groups in every county I've been working with. And that's probably why people with your interest in mind will be a, a big part of this, this group that gives us that input. Um, I've told every group along the way on every project I work, if you don't make it work in every local community, it's not gonna work. So if people in Fort Wayne are just wanting to pass through and you know, they don't care about your access, it's probably never gonna get done. So how do we give you that access that works for you is, is the key question. And everybody's not going to get what they want, but how can we get what everybody needs the most? And as far as decision making, we don't make any of them. I've got to be honest up front. We can come up with the best recommendation in the world and end up and say, no way. It's their road. They own it. And ultimately, they will do what they want or need to do. But my experience in doing these is if you get community consensus and you have good data behind why you want to do what you do, they'll go a long way toward doing that. But if you just willy-nilly say every driveway and every um, county road gets an interchange for $20 million, you're not going to get it. But if you're judicious about picking where they are and you have data about the traffic there, maybe emergency services, school transportation, those are real important factors in those things. If you have good data about that, they go a long way to convincing them not to do that. So it didn't work on 31, did it? it? He asked about 31. I guess I would say I've, I've worked on Highway 31. In Kokomo, it did work. Um, we worked with the county and the city and in back there. And we got in that to change 180 degrees on what they were going to do in Kokomo because of local input. And what the county wanted, what the city wanted, and turned it into a project that really worked well for them. And that is the end of my presentation. I will be available here afterward for questions. I have uh, James Turnwald with the Michiana Area Council of Governments, the MPO. Uh, that's going to talk about some specific uh, data that you have on Marshall County on the S30. Good evening, folks. <coughs> As mentioned, my name is James Turnwald, and I'm the Executive Director with the Michiana Area Council of Governments. Before I get started and explain who MACOG is and all of that, I just want to really recognize the County Commissioners, County Commissioner Dell, Commissioner Garner, Merrimark Center for being proactive, right? They have asked all of you here tonight to start a process, to provide feedback on something that MDOT, MDOT might do in the future. There are no plans right now. There's no set of plans. So this is really a great opportunity, an initial start, to really start to think through how you all can be involved, provide feedback, so that if MDOT is developing and develops a freeway project, that the local voice is heard in the county. So I want to thank them for that. So if you're not familiar, MACOG, or the Michigan Area Council of Governments, is a regional governmental entity that represents and serves St. Joe, Elkhart, Marshall, and Kosciuszko counties. Uh, and our mission, what we're set up to do, is to study and attempt to resolve regional issues. Um, so I'm not going to read all of that to you. But essentially, the purpose being is that transportation doesn't stop at a municipal boundary. So when you leave the city of Plymouth and enter the county or <laughs> enter a state facility, you as a driver have an expectation that you should be able to do that. And that sometimes these issues go beyond municipal boundaries and need to be coordinated. And so that is 
one of the many things in which we do is coordination, and we have a long-standing history in transportation planning. So I have some different traffic stats and statistics that I want to share with you. I don't want to bore you too much with data points, although I find data really interesting. You might have a lot of good questions that you want answered tonight, so I don't want to take up too much of that time. But if you're not familiar, um, what Dennis is talking about really in growing traffic trends is that across the nation, Federal Highway has looked at, this is just a map of truck traffic and what it does today in 2015 versus what it's supposed to do in 2045. There is supposed to be exponential growth of truck traffic on our U.S. highways and interstates. We at MACOG do traffic counting. So if you've ever run over two little black tubes on any of the local streets, those little pneumatic tubes, uh, or state streets, that's our office. We thank you for giving us traffic data by driving over them. We do that for 4,000 different locations across nine counties. These points, and you can find all this data online at our, at our website. These points that I've highlighted here are all of the count locations that we count every three years on US 30, just US 30. Um, because we, like I said, have a contract with the state of Indiana to do state facilities. So, um, those are all the locations that we have. And I just want to highlight two of them real quick on what they've been doing from 1999 to today. Uh, so this is US 30 between Oak Drive and Michigan Street, or State Road 17, that interchange that you all are familiar with that provides access into downtown Plymouth. In 1999, there were 14,000 vehicles that traveled over that location. During the recession, Traffic receded, decreased, which is a national trend that happened during the recession. But since then, we've seen significant growth. From 2011, it was 13,000 vehicles. 2014, 15,600 vehicles. Now in 2017, that's 16,800 vehicles. Is that, so, one, is that one way or both directions? That is both directions, Ralph. That's a great question. So we, I can provide, if anybody ever needed it, information by lane um, and that information we have but this just gives you that information for a snapshot of both east and westbound traffic what's going on there of that traffic throughout that time frame truck traffic has largely been at that data point and if we went out there today and i know you all know this because you see it all the time when you're waiting at that light at oak whether you just went to wendy's or arby's or you're going to work at zentis or wherever that there is significant truck volumes out there. It's 39% of that truck of that traffic is truck traffic. Okay. Um, and if you wonder how we get that information based on the spacing of those tubes that we have, it classifies the vehicle strikes into 13 different types of vehicles. So from multi-trailer truck all the way down to motorcycle. All right. And so that's how we're able to get those statistics. Here's another location, east of 31, between Iris and Hawthorne, um, that, again, we have a very similar, uh, <coughs> we didn't count this location back in 1999, so I apologize. But uh, from 2003, there were 11,500 vehicles, to 2017, there are now 15,000 vehicles. And approximately, throughout that time frame, 44% of those are trucks. Right? So that's significant truck volumes that are on US 30, and we're seeing significant growth throughout the last 10 years, really. And we're expecting, from Federal Highway's perspective, from NDOT's perspective, that that traffic will continue to grow. <coughs> the other points of why a freeway may be important, why we think it's important, is safety. All right? And I'm going to share with you stats just for Marshall County. So we have this information because we're able to access the state police database called ARIES. It has every crash reported, whether it's reported by the city of Plymouth, by state troopers. It all goes to the same database, and we're able to look at those. We're able to look at causes. We're able to look at totals. And this is what we see for crashes on just US 30 in Marshall County. This is a three year because we don't look at traffic typically 
traffic crashes in a one year because sometimes some weird things happen, you've got construction going on, but three years shows you more of a trend. And what we see here is in grand total, there have been almost just shy of 400 crashes on US 30 in just Marshall County. And 101 people have been injured. That could be severe injury, incapacitating injury to minor, you know, kind of neck injury based. Um, during that time frame, in 2014, there was also a fatality. I don't have on here the 2017 statistics, because you can imagine that this is a lot of information that we have to process. But I know personally that there have been a few fatalities in 2017 that happened on US 30 and Oak specifically. So I don't think that these numbers are going down. Okay, if anything, this shows a trend that these crashes are consistent and we've mapped all of that. If you ever want to know where those crashes are or how they're happening or where they're happening, we have that information. This just shows kind of heat maps of where most of the crashes occur on US 30 and, and Marshall County. And what I want to share with you is, is some key intersections and what those crashes kind of look like in Marshall County. So the one that, that um, has the most number of crashes is US 30 and Oak. So during that three year time period from 2014 to 2016, you have 67 <coughs> crashes that occurred at that location. 17 people were injured from incapacitating injuries or all the way down to, to you know, whiplash. Other locations of importance, US 30 and Pine had 27 crashes during that three year period. US 30 and Queen had 24 crashes during that period. US 30 and King Road or 9A, depending on how you want to reference it, had 22 crashes. And US 30 at Plymouth and Goshen Trail had 16 crashes. Grand total at the five locations, 156 crashes, 54 people injured. Just those five locations, well, and if you ever want to look at this, we provide this information to units of local government to try and help uh, make decisions. But we map where all those crashes occurred. So this is US 30 and Oak. Where all those crashes occurred, what were contributing factors, what was the primary factor of crash. You'll see a, uh, this is US 30 and Oak. So to orient yourself, Wendy's is here, Arby's is here, um, and Zentis would be down here in this location. Um, you see that the majority of the crashes occur, the median in the intersection, and the majority, a uh, large majority of the contributing factors are ignoring the signal, okay? Why that might be, I'm not gonna give you a scientific, this is why, but with the amount of freight traffic that is in this corridor, freight takes a while, truck traffic takes a while to get up and go and move, and when you've got three semis back, 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 to get them through, sometimes drivers can be impatient and they decide to run the light that they shouldn't. And so what we see at US 30 and Oak is a series of crashes that are contributed to ignoring the signal. That all, yes? Well, it also says, um, speed too fast for weather conditions. Yeah, so these are all of the... Right away, following two yep. these truckers are supposed to be professionals. Right. And, and I'm not... So it's not, it's not the traffic, it's the, it's the driver behind the wheel. It always and is. If they're not good enough to what they're supposed to do, then let's get them people off the road. Sure. So these are all of the reasons, every single reason, that a crash occurred at this location. The primary concentration of crashes is in ignoring the signal. So yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Sir, why can't, we, why can't we improve the signals? We put signs farther back so we could, it takes a semi a quarter mile to stop. They ain't gonna stop on down, right? Correct. I've got a CDL, I've driven semi, Correct. I've driven heavy equipment. Why can't we put the signs farther up the road for them to realize what's going on? Well, as we mentioned, there's no plans yet. There are no plans and I, I understand There are no decisions that, that have been made. So I think what we're looking to do tonight and moving forward in the future is to gain input on what are the potential strategies that we could if, if we put the signs farther back, whether these guys are on their phone, whether these guys are smoking their cigarette, not paying attention. Give them a couple signals to realize there's a stop sign at Queen and 30. There's a stop sign at Oak and 30. Let them get that 
quarter mile to stop that big rig. And, and you mentioned mile. Queen, and there have been efforts throughout the years to do advanced warning of signals, where crashes still are occurring at that location. So those are strategies that are looked at consistently okay. on how we can do advanced warning. Okay. Sir. They don't always work. Can, can we let him finish his presentation? It, write your question down, I'm sure he'll be glad to answer them, but let's let him finish the presentation if you wouldn't mind, please. So of the five intersections that we mentioned, of those crashes that occurred versus how many crashes occurred in Marshall County as a whole, those five intersections represent 40% of our crashes on US 30 in Marshall County, and they represent 53% of the injuries in Marshall County. Just those five locations. So those are the key stats that I wanted to be able to share with all of you to kind of enlighten you on how what Dennis was mentioning regarding US 30 and the potential needs for improvement on how those traffic statistics are related to Marshall County, what you all are seeing and experiencing in the terms of growth in traffic, growth in freight traffic, and then also what those crash information kind of looks like. So with that, I think any of us can take any questions. Um, I don't know if the commissioner or the mayor had any um, information that you would like to kind of follow up with, but I, I do not you've done a great job of presenting it, and so, nope. Thanks. <coughs> Is this going to force more traffic on the back roads? I mean, this is, it's, it's ridiculous the way it is right now. I live on 6th Road and it's heavily traveled the way it is. You force more traffic out there, the road's dangerous at best. It's going to become deadly. So it's going to just move the accidents. So is there a plan in place to make sure that this does not happen? That will happen in some places, but let me tell you about in another community, and I'll just say it is Warsaw, they're concerned about the exact opposite thing happening. That, that uh, you know, it's, everybody will go here instead of there, and it, you know, they're planning for now, how do we need to, to look at our access roads, our interchanges, and so forth, because if we do this, everybody's gonna take this local street, or take a county road, and so forth. That's all of what you got to consider in your local planning of how you want this to happen. If you just let it not plan it for you, they're not going to take that into consideration. Like you and your local elected officials will care about you a lot more than they do. Is any consideration when given to a wide path to the north of Plymouth, similar to what the college route, I guess they bypass the big section of that. Kokomo. Yeah, um, I, I would say that no decisions have been made at this point. Right. So, but have they looked at that? Uh, to me, the cost of trying to change all these roads is tremendous. Where if you go by 31 going through the country, I'm sure there's a whole lot of people that are going down close to Lake Bell in the past. So, you know, unfortunately, the way they designed it is killing them. So that's the I mean, that's part of what will be looked at. Yeah. Will be should we go north of Plymouth? Should we go south of Plymouth? Or should we stay on existing US 30? My bet is they'll say it's going to stay on existing US 30. Because they bought land for four lanes years ago when US 30 was built there. And there's enough <coughs> land there to build a freeway pretty much on the existing right of way. So they're going to stick to that probably. Uh, they could decide to do a northern bypass, but building what they call greenfield highways, just cutting out through the country and there's a good farm field that I'm going to take it, that doesn't happen much anymore. So I, I don't think they're going to do that, but technically it will have to be looked at in the federal process that's required for building our major improvement for a road like this, they have to do an environmental impact study. And in an environmental impact study, they have to look at all uh, feasible locations. So they'll look at going north, they'll look at going south, they'll look at going through, or they'll look at doing nothing at all and decide based on that. My prediction is they're going to stay on the existing route. Mr. Chairman, I had a question right here. You yes. can hold his hand. On, on this Council of Counties that's been looking at this. Oh, okay. The okay. coalition. Sure. Yes. Coalition. Yes. <clears throat> If you leave 
if you make the freeway on the existing height, what are you doing for access to the businesses along that highway? Such as, I manage a store behind the Aldi's next to the showroom buildings. People don't know I'm there now. But when, if they do this, I get no access because Oak Street, who knows what's going to be, that's going to be an interchange. But or not. That all has to be decided. And right now, if Michigan Road is an interchange, and you go up west and put another interchange like for Pioneer, how do you get the people to do things? And that's all part of what has to go into the local planning is now how do we give these business nodes like yours, how do we give them good access? And certainly now you build access roads along the side to get them back. It isn't the most convenient, but it does uh, help alleviate that problem because you can't put an interchange at every road. It just costs too much. And But certainly there'll be access roads built uh, along the right of way to get back to whatever, however that's deemed and worked out later. Um, okay, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. You had your end up. Yeah, you, yes. Sorry, Mr. Davenport. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, good, good. Um, public report trail, okay. <clears throat> By most um, travel, non-state highway, part of the county, we used to take care of And uh, may have more traffic than what even uh, 110, some of the state highways might. In but, but what we're running into that, that's that Queen Road you were talking about, one of those top areas. If we do not, do an intersection circle there and take that traffic down, you know, six road, we are going to definitely be paying through the county because to go and keep that road on up and all that traffic going down six road it is going to definitely cost you know, or seventh road, whatever it might be, to be able to get down towards the Walmarts and all that traffic area there. So it's a flow situation we need to be, you know, aware of, you know, as well as the uh, but what you got to remember is we do have old Lincoln Way. And yes, it's a little more out of, you know, convenient, but it, it will work. You may have to do something on the north side, and we do have vacant ground there that you could go over and feed uh, and access, you know, and bring, for a of the port trails. And, and not bring it all the way down to Dairy Queen, but bring it on in behind. Uh, uh, That's got to be determined. Maybe it's Pioneer, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Uh, it is a long ways, but we. INDOT's going to do something. Just remember what they're saying. INDOT's going to do something. Either we're a part of helping plan this, and it's not going to be everybody have what they want and the most convenient, but INDOT's going to do something. If we don't help plan this and give them ideas, and it's not going to fit everybody just perfect, they will do what they want to do. Well, people will go down Sixth Road, and it'll cost a lot of, a lot of repair. Sure. Yeah. Gentleman in the green hat, you had the next question. Yeah. Um, my question is, is the consideration for we live right on 30 on Union Road. Right now, you can't open your windows on the south side of your property. Well, you can turn TV up as loud as you want. You ain't gonna hear it. So you put more traffic out there. What about our property values? Well, who's gonna eat that? Do you have a driveway onto 30? Is that you say? No, you right on. 30? No, but I'm you live I'm right the there. Area. I can throw a rock and hit a truck. It depends on the, the uh, density of homes there, but there is federal re there is a federal requirement for noise abatement. <coughs> Sound walls in certain areas, uh, different uh, uh, contour of the roadway and the embankments, that sort of thing. But I, I'm not sure exactly what. The, the I mean, if I consider that already, I guess is my point. Pardon me. It's already been considered already. I but guess they is my don't. Point. They don't until they do a complete rework of a road that, you know, for the ones in existence, they're just the way they are. But when they rebuild the road or build a new one, then they have to put those in place. So with an improvement like this, sound abatement would be something they would have to take into consideration. The gentleman at the door has had his hand up quite a while, and Jerry will be next, so. Okay, so they put Pioneer Drive into 17, correct? And that was to cut down traffic? To go to Culver, make it an easier access to go to Culver. That's not happening, no. Not happen. Thank you. I live on Rose Road. I cannot let my kids go outside unsupervised on Rose Road because of all the ones coming from Illinois to cut. So what is this going to do for the farmers 
Huyens, Samuelsons. I know I, I don't have a big farm. But to get from my mom's house and my dad's house to my house, now I have to cross a freeway with a combine? Why? Now you're just making it difficult on the farmers who are trying to run a business. If I can answer, I mean, you're talking about your children's safety, and exactly. that's super important. Yes. So I'm assuming roads is not one of the major roads. It'll be probably cut off and rerouted somewhere else. That'll make your road safer. Or, or, it, or, it, or, it, or it could go, we would need to about as, as through the local planning process, right. we would evaluate whether there could be options to go over as well. And so I, I, I understand, you know, I get so, the whole cutting so off. So your crossing with a combine could be easier facilitated if there is, say, a bridge. Not necessarily, because now my travel time is long. Mother Nature's ready, Mother Nature's ready. And if you cut Rose Road off, now I've got extra tra travel time, correct? Well, no, what I was saying is that there could be multiple options. One option would be to cut off. Okay. The other option could be that you would build a grade crossing, so you build a bridge over, so it would take rows over 30. So that's going to be heavy enough for all the heavy equipment that Slonikers and Hoodians run across that, guaranteed. I am not an engineer. If they do not play one on TV. If they build it uh, in an agricultural <coughs> situation. How much hard land is sure going to take up? That the weight property. elements would carry it, that the uh, guardrails are in such a height that your equipment can go across. We've been dealing with this very issue in Stark County extensively. Okay. Okay. And the, the, the agricultural community is saying, well, we don't need to interchange everywhere, but if we had an overpass, a bridge, an overpass, just to get us to the fields on the other side, there are enough of us here and here that with these two overpasses, that would pretty much take care of what we're trying, but they they remind us, but remember the guardrails have to be so. We can get through there. Yeah. We can you know, get wide equipment. Exactly. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry had a question next, please. Jerry. Um, you know, Bill and James uh, really appreciate uh, you coming to Market County and help us work through these issues. And there are issues. It's important to hear people voice their opinion yeah. on roads. Uh, um, a real quick statement there's no plan today. Right. This is a process of identifying what's important to you, what's a, uh, important to to other people on this side of the room, and coming together with the overall plan. But uh, as we talk about plans, uh, let's not fall into the same uh, predicament or event that happened in ours. And so with that in mind, Bill and James, can you expand a little bit about that? What happened in terms of J-turns? How did the community come together? And what was the ultimate outcome of that? I, I think uh, maybe it was uh, Mayor Center mentioned that this whole coalition effort started with what began to happen in Columbia City. The same thing started to happen down at Argus at 10 and 110, that if you don't get this fixed and get it fixed right, they're going to come in and slap a Band-Aid of some kind on it that you like or don't like. Nobody liked it down there, and nobody's going to like those. J-turns are cheap. They're quick and cheap, and that's what they'll come in here and slap is if you don't figure out a way to do this, they'll say, well, we're not going to have people getting killed there anymore, so we're going to go up and make you go a quarter mile past the intersection, do a U-turn, and come back uh, to make your right turn, uh, the way that they were talking down in Argus. And in Columbia City, they were going to replace five stoplights with five J-turns. The mayor of Columbia City, the county commissioners in Whitley County, knew nothing about it. I don't mean to be critical of our friends of NDOT. They're really busy people and they got more to do than they have time to do it. But they developed these plans, had an engineer drawing up the plans, and the local elected officials didn't even know about it, much less people like you. <coughs> Columbia City found out they were ready to go to contract on five J turns in their city. And that's what you want to avoid is something's going to be done to fix it, and it may be something much, much worse than you think might be happening. Jerry, were you done? If, if, if you are, Connie, you were next. Where I live, from like Lemons Road to King Road, Lemons Road to 31, they want to cut off our access to 31. You go down over King Road, cross the rail tracks to 30, Pilot. Mm -hmm. if, if you close down, get access to Pilot, close down access to 31, you don't have 
21 way, over the rail track, on Lincoln Highway, you get in town, you're making us drive a whole lot farther, and we have a gravel pit right next to our place, and those trucks, we go up and down Keene Road consistently. What, what's going to be done about that if both 31 and 30 are closed off? So two things. Um, first off, just to start off with US 31, that project stopped at US 30. You, as of current, you can correct me if I'm incorrect, but as of current, south of US 30, so including 11th Road, there currently, again, are no existing plants. Okay. So, so we, we're going on what we were told several sure. years ago. <coughs> I understand that, but that's why I want to correct so that now, there. that there is not currently program, nor are there current plans for like existing plan sheets from INDOT for US 30 south of 30, or US 31 south of 30. Um, what you have seen is some projects that have come to light, like the 31 and State Road 10, but they have been to a much smaller scale than what you saw north of 30. <coughs> okay. So as of right now, I don't know that your 11th road access is... What will it do to pilot truck stop though? Well, yeah, I think these are the considerations that we would need to look at. Where are the potentials for interchanges? Where are the potentials for overpasses or bridges? And what does that access look like? Because King Road carries considerable north-south volumes. And so that's going to be a major consideration in all of this. And, and, and Connie, just think about this as a pilot. And, and I agree, that's a, that's a bottleneck. I'm not sure what they do. The county highway's there. But logically, if you think about it, they're probably not going to put two interchanges. They're not going to put an interchange. That they've already got one at 31. They're probably not going to put one at pilot. So there'll have to be something figured out on what you do with that truck traffic or you know, I'm not sure what the answer is, but logically, I doubt they're going to put two interchanges back to back within a mile of each, less than a mile. Of yeah, each. so, so INDOT's typical rubric for that when they're right. making, and these are things that we'll, we'll think through, all of us collectively, uh, is that typically interchanges in a built environment in a more urban area or a city environment like Plymouth, you're not going to put interchanges per INDOT standards, typically closer together than one mile. In rural areas, the closest they're going to put them together is three miles, okay? So just that's generally just a food for thought kind of item. So every road will not be an interchange, but how that whole sequence of over-unders, interchanges, cutoffs, local access, it's all got to be considered in a whole portfolio um, to make sure that local access is preserved. A quick one, and then we need to get to the okay. You said that about the accidents. Um, Togo has accidents all the time, and it's a freeway. So, I mean, you're not, to me, you just. Add yeah, some so other I didn't bring toll road stats with me, and I apologize for that. But, I mean, there is a different level of, of crashes. <laughs> There are weak spots at intersections where you have the potential for T-bones that you wouldn't have on the toll road. So yes, on every system there are accidents and crashes, but there are safety issues when you see this level of traffic, the increases in traffic, the level of freight, and then the stop and go aspect of it. I love they did the Pokemon though. they did that I think we had some questions back here. Yes, yeah. ma'am. I'm gonna go back to your truck traffic and, and your as freeway as you can hear, and you want to make it faster every day I travel dirty every day I get passed by at least 20 trucks while I'm doing speed limit mm -hmm. they're doing 75 80 why do we want that who's going to patrol that who's going to fix that and they're running side by side in convoys I don't think what are you going to do about that faster we're certainly not wanting to make this. Well, speed. let's make it slower then. It maybe be. they won't travel our road because maybe if you put it down to 40, maybe they'll go 60 <laughs> instead of going 85 and blowing me off the road because I drive a little car. So, you know, I mean, I think it's great and wonderful about progress in urban areas. I don't live in an urban area, I didn't buy a house in an urban area, I brought it in a rural spot so I didn't have to deal with this. And now government comes in once again and says, well, too bad for you. You're going to do it, you're going to live with it, you're going to like it, or you're going to lose money. Either or. Yes. That's your decision. 
So live with it. I, don't be mad about it. I guess I don't agree with that, but I, I would say we, we're not, our aim is not to make speeds faster. It's to make the facility safe for the, the traffic it carries and the speeds that If they, they drive in both lanes now, so let's add thir a, a third lane so they can take three lanes. How many, let's make it four. Then they can just cruise right on through. There is no fixing the problem if people are not going to abide by the law in the first place. Hey, I appreciate your point. We've got some other questions, sir. Okay. I was just wondering, you were talking about 38,000 uh, cars possibly going up to 81,000. Does anybody have numbers on the toll road? What, what goes across on the toll road? I, I, I can get that for you, but I, I have you. numbers. Are there, I, there's 45 million vehicles that travel the Indiana toll road in the world. So the stats that we were sharing though is a uh, what you would see in an average day. Yeah. Okay. So different different spectrums. Do you have that number on yours? I wouldn't have it on our side because the toll road is leased by a private concessionaire, so they're not part of our indoc contract. But they do share that information on plazas. It's not currently posted on our website. I don't have it on the top of my head. Um, but when you look at US 30 in our region, uh, I do know that typically in our area, in our four county region, 